Join us now for Education Matters, a weekly look at the real people and real stories in education across North Carolina. Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm Keith Poston. The General Assembly is scheduled to reconvene next Wednesday for a continuation of the 2017 regular session. Will changes to the class size mandate that has generated so much attention be taken up? Or how about the new principal pay plan passed last year that could result in pay cuts for many school leaders, particularly our most experienced ones? What else might be on the legislative agenda for education? We'll discuss these topics and more with our guests today. Before we tackle our main topics, we open with headlines, a quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. As I mentioned at the top, the General Assembly is set to convene next week, and legislative leaders have said little about what they will take up or how long they'll be in session. Both House Speaker Tim Moore and Senate Leader Phil Berger have said they could take up possible amendments to the state constitution and Governor Roy Cooper's appointments to state boards, including appointees to the State Board of Education made by the governor months ago. Possible amendments to the constitution have generated the most chatter here in Raleigh, including a move to eliminate judicial elections and have the legislature appoint judges. Another constitutional amendment reportedly being floated would eliminate the State Board of Education. Any amendments to the state constitution would require a three-fifths majority in both chambers and approval by North Carolina voters. A new study published by UNC Charlotte's Urban Institute highlights North Carolina's magnet schools. North Carolina has the sixth most of any state and has been a national leader since the 1970s using magnets to promote diversity and educational choices for families. Wake, Durham, and Charlotte Mecklenburg were among those that created magnet schools with an eye toward promoting school diversity. Finally, over the holidays, we lost two great education leaders, both from Cumberland County. Dr. Jack Britt passed away on December 22nd. A lifelong educator, Dr. Britt served as assistant superintendent and associate superintendent but before becoming superintendent of Cumberland County Schools in 1980. He later went on to serve at Campbell University. Dr. John Griffin was Cumberland County's first African-American superintendent, and he passed away on December 28th. Dr. Griffin retired in 1997 after more than 39 years in the public schools and was regarded as an icon in the Cumberland County school system throughout his positions as a teacher, principal, and superintendent. Our thoughts and prayers are with both the Britt and Griffin families. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum's website at ncforum.org, click on Education Matters, and read more about each of these headlines as well as other topics we cover each week. As I said at the top of the show, today we're going to talk about the upcoming session of the General Assembly. Since we don't know what we'll be taking up, we're going to start out first talking with our guests about something they hope will be taking up, that is the K-3 class size mandate. And joining us to talk about that, we have Julie Von Hafen. Julie is the president of the Wake County PTA Council. She also is the advocacy chair for the North Carolina PTA. Julie, welcome. And we have Dr. Tim Markley, a return guest to the show. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Markley is the superintendent of New Hanover County Schools. Um, Dr. Markley, I'm going to start with you. There are an, always a number of legislative issues that affect the classroom, but at this point right now, it seems that the class size issue has been topping the list. It's certainly been generating the most attention. Can you give us a sense of how that, um, that mandate has been affecting New Hanover County schools? Sure. Uh, Keith, thanks for the invitation. In New Hanover County, we've spent the last year looking at how we're going to implement K-3 class size. We put together a committee to look at ways to do it. And so we've got some creative issues around grouping of teachers, pairing teachers. It will impact us in terms of loss of classrooms for some of our music teachers. The real issue for us, though, going forward is the planning piece. We simply need to know how we're going, how the art and music positions are going to be funded so that when we go to our county commissioners with our budget, we know how much we're, we're looking to ask for for them. So that's a concern for us. Second is our recruiting. We hire several hundred teachers a year. So with a class size reduction, we're going to be looking for more teachers. And our concern is where we're going to find those highly qualified teachers. And I mean, this, it's January, obviously. Um, it's already, I mean, you're, you're midway through the, uh, the school year. This will be the time that you really would like to already know, so have some certainty, right? We're in our, our planning process right now, uh, budget-wise. So we're looking at uh, what, we're gonna, what our ask is going to be. And there are some legislative mandates on when you have to go to the county commissioners. So the sooner that we can uh, clear up what the funding mechanisms are, the better off we're going to be in uh, New Hanover. Right. Now, Julie, it's, um, as I mentioned, 
this class size mandate has gotten a lot of attention and, and frankly, parents have been some of the most visible and vocal, uh, certainly um, uh, I've seen it in the news here in Wake County, but really across the state. Uh, why are parents so uh, uh, engaged in this issue? Well, our members across the state are very concerned about the class size mandate. It really affects every child in North Carolina, whether you have kids in K-3 to or higher grades. With the funding shifts of moving teachers to the K-3 space, we feel like it's going to affect kids all across North Carolina. And I think parents have really engaged on that because it's affecting them personally. It's affecting their child. It's affecting the loss of these specials. It's affecting possibly the loss of their classroom space. Um, it's affecting their teachers. And I think the teachers are sharing that with the parents and then the parents are getting engaged on the issue. Now you, you mentioned this and I can ask Dr. Markley about this too, but it, uh, it's not a K-3 issue only. It's, it's what, um, what you're hearing from parents um, um, and also from the schools is the concern <laughs> that it's a ripple effect up through grades four and really up through 12. Um, how does that, uh, what are you hearing about that from your, uh, from your members? Well, so this year, I mean, there was already a gradual phasing of the class size mandate. So in, in here in Wake County, we're especially seeing um, classrooms in fourth and fifth grade particularly that have um, students upwards of 30 to 35 kids in a classroom. That's not good for our kids. It's not good for the teachers because they're dealing with a lot of those discipline issues that arise when you have that many children in a small space. Um, as far as middle and high school, we've heard that if uh, funding needs to be shifted to the K-3 space, that um, schools especially that offer uh, electives and things like that, optional classes, those will disappear in middle and high school to shift the funding down to K-3. Right, and that, is that, uh, that's something that, um, I don't know if that's happening in New Hanover County, but I've heard that as well, that the concern is, it may not, it may not even see the impact um, uh, directly, it's just things won't happen. There won't be extra classes. There won't be another AP course added. Is that something you're having to look at? And particularly your fourth and fifth grade. Uh, when you start to have to put more, more students into that same building, more classes for the same number of students, it's going to put a pressure on fourth and fifth grade. So you're going to see larger classes uh, in, our, in our district and, I was, and across the state because we all understand small class sizes are a good thing. But if it's only, but if it doesn't impact, if it's not small class sizes for everybody, then you end up creating these larger classrooms in the upper grade, and it does have that ripple effect up the line. So we've got a, a real concern about what the impact will be beyond third grade into those upper grades. Let me ask you this: This is something that this issue has been particularly hard to um, cover on this show because we don't seem to be able to agree on the actual facts. I mean, that's been what, what I, because sure. what we're hearing, I mean, you, you're one of many superintendents who've been on the show, who we've talked to, who are telling us this is a big issue. We don't have enough classrooms. We don't have enough funds. We don't, we can't recruit enough teachers. Legislators, particularly in the Senate, are saying this is a made up issue, that it's been funded, um, that this is, uh, that superintendents like Dr. Tim Markley has been, have been using this money for something else. So uh, what's, what's your answer to that? Well, I mean, and I can't speak for other superintendents. We've met all of the class size requirements the state has put down over the years. So when this comes down, it impacts us in terms of how we fund those extra special positions. Uh, the state the legislature has said that they're going to fund those, and I have every, every belief that they're going to, to do that. The question for us is how we do that so that when we go to our county commissioners, and they're great partners with us, we know we need these, this number of positions to continue what we're doing. So it's that uncertainty factor for us that's really the concern. Right. Julie, last word from you. What do you want to see happen? We want to see them take action to have a fix on this. And like, as Dr. Markley said, we need it quick because of the funding issues with going into next year, especially here in Wake County, we have year-round schools that are already planning on hiring and assignment decisions for July. And so waiting until May to the short session is just too late. So we really want them to take action soon. And so the action would be, I mean, obviously, I mean, there's a couple of things that could happen, right? You could just eliminate the, the mandate right. and, and let the superintendents uh, make their own choices. The other would be to properly fund it. Exactly, yeah. Restoring some of the flexibility on class sizes, I think, would help as well. Here in Wake County, we've heard that. Is that help. what you're looking for, too? We're just looking for them to uh, put, 
fix it as soon as possible. Like I said, the, it's the law. We can make it work. Will there be issues with space? Yes. Will there be issues with larger classes and other grades? Yes. But once we know what the, the funding mechanism is for those specialty teachers, we can get into the planning part. All right. Well, thank you both for being here. Uh, we're going to keep watching this. We'll keep reporting on it. We'll see what happens uh, next week. Thanks so much. All right. Thank now, when we come back, we're going to continue our discussion about the upcoming legislative session with representatives from the North Carolina School Boards Association and the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation. But first, see if you can answer this question. According to a national survey of teachers, which of the following changes or reforms have directly affected them in the past two school years? Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer E, all of the above? Nationally, teachers said they have felt the impact of all the changes listed, with changes to the teacher evaluation system as the most common change, followed by changes to their curriculum. Joining us now to continue our discussion about education policy issues is Tracy Zimmerman. Tracy is the executive director of the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation. That is a group that is focused on making sure that every child in North Carolina has access to a high quality early childhood education. And next to her is Bruce Mildorf. Uh, Bruce is the Associate Director of Government Relations for the North Carolina School Boards Association. There are, I believe, 116, I looked it up, school boards across the state. Um, and so you represent all of them, which, um, and of course, these issues we're talking about have a big impact on the, the local school boards and county commissions, as we just heard. Tracy, I want to start with you. Mm -hmm. Um, we were just talking about the K-3 class size mandate with our first two guests. Now your group has, uh, and, and others, have expressed concerns about the impact that this mandate is, may have on pre-K and early childhood. How does that happen? Yeah, so first I, I do want to say um, that it's good that the General Assembly is paying attention to kindergarten through third grade. Those years have long been sort of a little neglected because they weren't tested grades and so we know that smaller class size is certainly a good thing. However, there's also a finite number of classrooms. There are a certain number of teachers that are in the pipeline and there are huge capacity issues to make this happen. So if you have NC pre-K classrooms in a public school, and they need a classroom for smaller class size, you can't just magically make a new classroom appear. Something has to give. And that's what we're starting to hear. We've talked with um, superintendents and others across the state who are really thinking about is pre-K, which is not a mandate, something that I have room for if I have to make space right. for um, And that's, that's a, a great point, right? The, the, because the K-3 class size caps, the hard per classroom cap, is a law. They have to fill, but if they have to go, we had uh, Superintendent uh, Ray Spain on a few weeks ago, and he was really concerned about this. And he said, I fought for years to get pre-K in Warren County, and, I, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to get rid of it just for space. Exactly. Space and teachers. I want to highlight that as well because you have a certified teacher who has a, a, a BA in education in a pre-K classroom, and so those teachers also will be needed for the K through to, to fill those classrooms. So you have a growing um, pool of teachers you're gonna need to pull from and that pool does not necessarily exist. All right, Bruce, school boards across the state have been hearing about this issue for a couple years. I mean, they've been talking to their peers on the county commissions, they've been hearing from their school superintendents. What are they telling uh, the association? What are you, what are y'all working on with the, with the General Assembly? Oh, I mean, a whole slew of things. Um, one thing I want to add uh, after what Tracy just said is, you know, we hear that this is a K-3 issue, an enhancement teacher issue. This is a system-wide issue, right? It's, I mean, it's pre-K to 12th grade, and it affects everyone. Um, you know, one thing that we're hearing, and we did a survey among all the, the school districts, heard back from about 30%, and just hearing from those 30%, there are dozens of K-5 classrooms that last year had a unfilled position, not just the, during the first week or the first month, by in March. Permanent substitutes, in March, basically. You had long-term subs in dozens of classrooms. And when we hear about this teacher shortage, um, where are they gonna come from, number one? You have Wake County, they need hundreds of teachers. 
I'm not really too concerned about Wake County because, well, they're not going to go to other states. Right. They're going to go to Franklin County, Harnett, Lee, Wilson. And so now you have all these other districts in the lurch. I mean, that's one thing. And then as far as the classroom space, when you reduce class sizes, you need more classrooms. Timing is a huge issue. Right. So they need to, they need to know how many classrooms they're going to get, and it takes time. One thing that Tracy said, and I, and I do want to repeat it, we all support smaller class sizes. It is a good thing. But you can't just do it in isolation. Right. And that's what we keep hearing, and that's what we've tried to make the point on this show when we've had other guests on, is it's, it's, it's positions and it's also space. And all of those things take funding and they take time. And, right. and, and it seems like the, what we're, is, we don't have either of those things right now. Well, I think that's right. And I think like any project, if you will, it's, this is about growth, right? If you want to grow something, so you want more, you want to have fewer class size, uh, excuse me, smaller class sizes. It's about how do you grow your system, if you will. You have to plan for it. You have to have stages that help you get there, right? So we need to think about what do we need to do to build the uh, classroom space? What do we need to do to build the capacity and the teacher pool? Which, by the way, goes well beyond pre-K through 12, we have it in childcare where we need highly qualified teachers. And so what is our long-term plan if this is our goal to have smaller class sizes to achieve that? Right. Speaking of long-term, Bruce, I want to uh, shift gears a little bit. Um, okay, so that's one, on the bond. Go ahead. You can add in. Then I want to talk, to about, I want to talk mean, about the bond. The, the General Assembly is starting to look long-term, and they are yes. putting policies in place to bring more teachers online. Right. But then they're reducing the class sizes well before you have those policies coming into place. Okay. So if nothing else, you know, we should all be shooting for smaller class sizes, but let's look at the entire picture. And if those teachers are coming on in a few years, well, let's, you know, do it all together in a big picture way where it can be successful. Right. Where we're not creating and setting principles and these systems, setting them up to fail. Right. Your school boards don't have taxing authority, so they can't raise revenue, but they're uh, in the, the counties are responsible for school buildings, infrastructure. This has affected this too. Um, school Board Association making a big push this year to, to, uh, on uh, school bonds well, and, and school buildings. That is one of our priorities, and it is the single top priority for county commissioners. And, and that's what we're talking about in the K-3 class size. You know, we need to look uh, in totality. And so if we need more classrooms, before this issue even came up, statewide, over the next five years, we're looking at an $8 billion need for, for school construction. Whether it's because you have schools crumbling, you know, they're old, they need to be bigger, they need to be updated. And so tying K-3 in with the infrastructure, we are looking and, and, and asking, there have been two bills already filed in the House and in the Senate um, by members in the majority who say that we need a statewide bond, $1.9 billion, just to give locals uh, a kickstart right. well, with lots, these classrooms. Lots of issues. Not lots of time left. So thank you both for being here today. We're going to keep talking about these issues. I hope you'll both come back as the uh, this session or whatever in the next session. And of course, we still have a short regular session in May. So uh, thanks for what you do and thanks for helping us understand these issues a little bit better. After the break, this week's leadership spotlight. Each week, Education Matters spotlights individuals demonstrating exceptional leadership in education in North Carolina based on nominations from you, our viewers. This week, we spotlight Dan Schnitzer. Schools play an integral role in not only teaching sustainability, but implementing sustainability. Our school district has uh, over 2 million square feet and hundreds of acres of land. Uh, so we have a real opportunity to be a positive influence. So we do a lot of work in sustainability in our district. Um, 
and the administrative end on energy management. Uh, that not only has a positive environmental impact, every dollar that we're able to save on utilities we can bring back into the classroom and into educating. And one of the really fun experiences that I have is to be able to tie that into student education. One of the things we do whenever we use LED lights is bring in a pedal power generator. Uh, where the kids actually use their physical strength and their physical energy to power up an incandescent, a fluorescent, and an LED light. And they can feel the difference. When we talk about energy savings, it's a concept, it's a philosophy. Maybe best case scenario it shows up on an energy bill, but when you're the one actually producing the energy, you can really get a sense of what that means to save energy. And we can tie that into science lessons on uh, potential energy, kinetic energy, mechanical energy, and then into electrical energy. We can talk about economics. So yeah, the, CF, the LED bulb costs more. Let's mark that on a graph of where it costs, and then let's mark where an incandescent light bulb costs. And let's see how much it costs to operate, and where those lines intersect, and what that point means, and what the different areas on the graph means. We, I do a lot of worm composting um, with students, so all of our cafeterias uh, compost their food waste. We've diverted over 800,000 pounds in three years, it will cross a million pounds this year, and we've got 12,000 students every day that are diverting their food waste. And so to really understand what that process is, I'll go around with my worm bin, and students will get to look at worms and analyze them, and it could be in the context of habitats, it could be in the context of life cycles, it could be in the context of soil science or of composting itself. Uh, and through that, they're able to understand that when they put their food waste and their compostable trays in the green bin, that the process has just started. All the gardens that we do, I always make sure if we're doing it in boxes, that there's one box that doesn't get planted in. And the reason for that is because kids like to just dig in the dirt. And even when we have gardens, so many adults want to say like, no, don't dig in there, we put the vegetables in there. Uh, but let's let kids dig in there. I think we have the real opportunity with the youngest students to start them off on this path in the right way, but I also really love engaging with the older students that maybe have started to drift from their relationship with nature. As humans, over time, we see technology and we see progress as a way of separating out from nature. But I don't think as humans we ever lose our general instincts towards nature. And part of this work is reconnecting that. Those are your public schools. If you know someone that deserves to be recognized, visit our website, ncforum.org, and click on Education Matters, and you'll find a link to nominate someone in your community. After the break, this week's final word. It's a new year of Education Matters. We'll certainly have no shortage of topics to cover when it comes to education policy. What with the upcoming legislative sessions we discussed today and the regularly scheduled short session set to begin in May. We can also expect significant legal activity affecting education, including the North Carolina Supreme Court taking up the state board versus the state superintendent and general assembly lawsuit. There are also two major school funding review efforts underway a legislative task force on education finance reform, and the Governor's Commission on Access to Sound Basic Education. We'll have guests on from both of those efforts soon to find out what they hope to accomplish. Next week, the Public School Forum publishes our annual local school finance study, and on January 24th, we'll release our top 10 education issues for 2018, a mix of the issues we believe will be most important and those we believe should be most important. We'll have a special show that week featuring a panel discussion at our Eggs and Issues breakfast before a live studio audience of educators, business leaders, and policymakers. And of course, all this education policy activity will happen against a backdrop of 2018 midterm elections, where new state legislative districts remain tied up in legal and legislative wrangling. We'll do our best here to help you make sense of it all, and most importantly, explain how it will affect your children and their educational opportunities. We're also going to visit more schools this year and talk to more teachers, principals, parents, and students. You care about education or you wouldn't be tuning into the show. We want to cover the policies, but we also want to show you what it looks like inside. There's a lot of great things happening in our state's public schools, and we want to help tell that story. That's it for this week's show. Next week, we're going to be talking about local school finance. So make sure you tune in, and thanks for watching.